My original story is long gone, so please, don't try to find it. The situation is bad enough as it is. It all started around a week ago when I finally worked up the courage to post my first story online. Like most people who frequent horror subs, I've been a lurker for a long time, years even. Writing had always been a pastime for me, but I guess I was intimidated by seeing the upvote counts in the thousands. It blew my mind to think of the creative minds behind some of these stories. Even harder to picture the real life horror some had experienced. It seemed impossible to break in and the defeatist in me didn't even want to try. But then it happened. I found the one. You know what I mean. The one. That one story that crawls into your limbic system and sinks its tentacles in deep. You dream about it at night. You space off during meetings, fantasizing about its climatic end. The one community that seems perfect for it, geared right toward your vision. I spent weeks working on it, poring over every sentence, finding crumbling old books from the antique shop down the street to steal a few Latin phrases out of. I was sure, deep in my gut, that if I could just pull it off, that it would be a masterpiece. Now I'm not saying it was or anything. At the end of the day, it was just a story like any other. But I was proud of it. Proud enough to share my work with the world for the very first time. I sucked a breath in, hit submit, and promptly poured a neat glass of makers to wait the response. The first person who upvoted for my story was Ike from Idaho. He was a cool guy. Round red cheeks and a big round gut. Way into Star Wars and Dungeons and Dragons. He's got some lingering issues with women after his parents divorce. But over the last few years, therapy has been really setting him right. Plays a mean game of Uno. From what I've been told. Although sometimes, I think he just likes to brag. How do I know he was the first one who voted? Because the second he hit that little gray arrow, he appeared out of thin air in my bedroom. I'd staggered in, set the whiskey down, pulled off my t-shirt and went for a pair of sweatpants in the dresser. Just as I pushed the jeans down around my ankles, I heard a popping sound, like thunder cutting through the dry summer air. When I looked up, there he was. I screamed and snapped my pants up. He screamed and tripped over a pile of clothes, throwing his back against the wall. Who the fuck are you? I yelled at him. Who I am? His eyes were wide, incredulous. Swollen hands padded against his pockets. Who are you? I stumbled back and around the corner of my bed, hands held up protectively in front of me. My mind raced, trying to figure out if anything I had hidden in my room could be used as a weapon. He was bigger than me by a head and a half. The last time I'd been in a fight was in third grade when Clayton Brines kicked me into a pile of dog shit. I fell and busted my glasses when I tried to retaliate. Fuck that guy. Ike didn't have the same inclination though, thankfully. Instead, he turned and ripped the door open, pulling his cell phone from his pocket as he ran for the front of my apartment. I followed behind him, happy to see him out, preparing to barricade the door behind him. He was tugging at the knob, beating at his phone screen at the same time. The door wouldn't budge, but he raised his ringing phone up to his ear regardless. Help, please help, I've been kidnapped. What? I snapped from behind him. Kidnapped? You broke in. The line went dead as another pop ripped through the air. 
to our left, a young woman with speckled glasses and long dishwater blonde hair appeared in the living room. Her mouse eyes darted between us and filled with fear. Ike and I looked at each other, suspicions turning ice cold in our throats as we tried to grasp what was going on. I have GPS on my phone. The girl stammered out, raising it in front of her like a shield. My parents will find me. You, you won't get away with this. We won't hurt you, Ike promised. Just the thought of it seemed to scare the piss out of him, but he quickly glanced my way. Well, I won't, I scoffed. I won't either. I looked back at the girl. It's okay. Just, what's your... I trailed off. Glowing on her screen was an all too familiar app and a title that made my stomach sink. What are you reading? I asked, voice low. Her phone dropped in front of her. She glanced down at the screen. She must have forgotten in the chaos. Oh, I don't know, just, just some scary story. About a book from an antique shop? I asked. And the little girl at a horse farm? Ike injected. We didn't have much time to debate further until another person joined us. And then another, and another. Each had the same reaction. Fear, confusion. And then the sobering realization of what they had all in common. They'd all been reading my story. And, God help them, they'd like it. The door held tight, even as we pulled and cursed at the knob. Frank from Texas found a screwdriver in the junk drawer and tried to pry the hinges. They wouldn't budge. We all pulled the blinds from the sliding glass window leading out into the balcony. We beat against it, screamed, threw metal folding chairs towards it, along with a coffee table. Not so much as a crack. Worse yet, the people on the street below didn't even seem to hear us. We were trapped, invisible. Phone lines weren't going through either. Ike got the closest, but anyone else that tried got no signal. Finally, it occurred to me to make my way back to my laptop in the bedroom and delete the story for good. By then, I had to squeeze through a thick crowd of bodies. Sweat dripped down my forehead from the mounting heat. I struggled to pull in a full lungful of air. People spilled out into the kitchen, the bathroom. They were stacked up on my bed like rag dolls. I thought about slipping into the closet to escape for a moment, to have just one second of privacy. I wasn't sure if I'd be able to push the door back open if I did. The story had 108 upvotes when I got the site loaded up again. 108. Not bad for my first story. Not great for the number of people to shove into my one bedroom apartment. I don't know who will see this. If our families will ever know what became of us. But this is the only page that will load. I had to tell someone. The food ran out days ago. I wasn't known for my well-stocked pantry before this, and it quickly ran dry as we all struggled to survive. Even passing water around is nearly impossible at this point. The smell. God. I can't describe it. I think some people have already died. Though where and how, I have no idea. That's the only thing I could think of that could smell like that. Even past the sweat and the fear, something sharp and visceral tugs just below the surface. Sometimes, past the low, constant hum of chatter, I hear something growling in the distance. Mom, Dad, I love you guys. Please, stay off Reddit. Don't poke around on my computer. And for anyone that read my story, I'm sorry. 
I'm so sorry, but I think whatever is holding us here is about to show us why. I just didn't think that hotels would be book solid on the Saturday after Christmas. I snapped. Nicole, come on. This was supposed to be fun. No, you idiot. This was supposed to be the last ditch attempt to save our marriage. Look, we'll sleep here in the car. And in the morning, we'll get one of those mushroom omelets you like. He leaned the seat back hitting me squarely in the elbow. Good night, Nicole. I love you. I mumbled the response. Then I lay across the back seat, pulled the covers over me, and stared out the window. If I wasn't so mad at him, I might have enjoyed it. We were parked on a narrow road smack dab in the middle of nowhere, surrounded by forest and the stars. In the distance, Five amber lights glowed all in a line, probably street lights from the next town over. No, wait, six lights. Huh, that's odd. I could have sworn there were only five. I shrugged, lay my head on the armrest, and closed my eyes. I jolted awake. The crick in my neck ached. The car was freezing cold. All was quiet, save for the sporadic hoots of an owl and Brandon's light snoring. Oh, sure, he was sleeping peacefully. I glanced out the window. It was totally dark outside. The amber lights had been turned off. That's weird. Usually street lights stay on, don't they? I thought. Or maybe sometimes they go off. Oh, I don't know. I reached for my water bottle in the cup holder up front. Huh? Through the windshield, there they were. The seven amber lights shining even more brightly than before. I glanced back to my window, pitch black, to the windshield, lights on, back and forth, over and over, but it was clear. The lights were on, but then, why couldn't I see them through my window? No, there was some light coming in, through the top and upper corners of the window, but the middle was still black, in a dark silhouette that kind of looked like a person. No, there's no way, but then I blinked, and it moved. I jumped back. Brandon. He snorted and mumbled. What? There's something out there. Probably just a raccoon. No, Brandon. This is serious. Turn on the car. Okay, okay, easy. I heard the click of the keys. The rumble of the engine. The headlights blinked on. Flashing the forest with white lights. I pointed to the window. Brandon, look, someone is... I don't see anything. I turned to the window, ready to shut him down. Nobody was there. I began to laugh. Oh, I can't believe that. I actually thought someone was standing at the window, staring in, blocking out those eight orange lights. Ha, huh. I must have been half dreaming. Oh. What a... The car lurched forward. Uh, Brandon? What are you doing? We've got to get out of here, he said, his voice shaking. What are you talking about? Look at the window, Nicole, he yelled. There wasn't anything there, but then I saw it. There, in the middle of the window, was a patch of fog. Not on the rest of the glass, just in one small circular area, almost as if someone had their face pressed against the glass. No, it can't be. How? Shaking, I climbed into the passenger seat, 
We shot down the dark road. The shadows rolled across the trees, across the deep footprints in the snow, and the amber lights seemed brighter, closer. Were we driving towards them? There were more of them too, at least a dozen. Don't worry, Nicole, Brandon said. I'll protect you. The anger bubbled up, and suddenly, the reason I couldn't stand him anymore, the reason our marriage was failing, that I had buried deep inside myself, shot out. You'll protect me? Like you protected me on 4th Avenue? Are you still mad about that? Of course I'm still mad about it. You ran. Brandon. There was a gun against my ribs. I thought I was gonna die. And you ran away. I was getting help. And what if he shot me? Huh? You would've just let me bleed out on the sidewalk alone? There were at least 20 of the lights now. Some so bright, they looked as if they crossed the forest threshold any second. But if they were street lamps, how come I didn't see any roads? But he didn't shoot, and he wasn't going to. Brandon took a deep breath in through his nostrils. You know, it was your fault for wearing one of those expensive Kate whatever purses. That's the whole reason he targeted us. Really? Brandon, you're going to blame me for being mugged? You were a coward that night, and you know it, or you wouldn't be so defensive. I wasn't a coward, I was just being logical. The car screeched to a stop. A branch lay straight across the road, or it was more like a small tree that someone had ripped straight out of the ground. My heart stopped. They blocked us in. Brandon jerked the steering wheel and started to turn the car around. No. Two people had come out of the forest and were standing behind the car. Each one was holding a pole and at the top there was something orange, light flickering. Are those jack-o'-lanterns? Brandon said. To call them jack-o'-lanterns was an understatement. Atop the poles were flashy orange things, carved with faces, but they were far scarier and more realistic than any jack-o'-lantern I had seen. One had the face of a man, contorted in pain, mouth wide open in a scream. The other was even worse, a grinning woman with pointed teeth and flickering yellow eyes. I thought they were street lamps. I whispered. The two figures marched forward, towards the car. As I glanced at the forest, I saw more of the amber lights coming towards us, shining through the tangled trees. Several. Dozens. No. Many more than that. Some were far away, just orange dots among the murky shadows. Others were right upon us, floating over the asphalt. And some were just dark figures, slithering through the underbrush, not holding a lantern of any sort. Can't we drive over the branch? No, we'll get a flat, then we'll really be stuck. He unclicked his seatbelt. I'm going out there. Are you insane? I screamed. The low hum of a chant came through the windows, muffled and low. There are dozens, maybe hundreds. I got to prove to you I'm not a coward though, he said with a smile. Brandon, no. Slam. He stepped out into the darkness. As soon as he did, the figures froze. They seemed to stare at him, heads tilting towards him. Though I couldn't make out their faces in the dim light, he grabbed the base of the branch and tugged on it with all his might. It slid towards him, opening up a small spot of road. That's when something like a shiver rippled through the crowd. 
And then, all at once, they started racing towards him. No, I screamed, pounding the glass. Go, Brandon yelled. They were closing in, just a few feet away from him now. Drive. I shook my head. Nicole, please. One of the men grabbed him by the shoulders and pulled him towards the darkness. A few more paced towards the car, their jack-o'-lanterns floating inches from the window. No, not jack-o'-lanterns. Or, at least, not the kind made out of pumpkins. Drive, Brandon screamed as they pulled him into the forest. I jumped into the driver's seat and put my foot to the floor. We buried an empty casket. They never found the body. And sometimes, I think it's better that way. Something tells me that the body wouldn't have been recognizable. And seeing the man I love broken up like that would break my heart all over again. And if he's still alive, well, that means he's become one of them. And that's even worse. So, please, take it from me. If you're driving on a desolate wooded road and you see some orange lights through the trees, say a prayer for Brandon Wright, then get the hell out of there. It all started with a... I checked my phone to see the notification. Your package is arriving today. I stared at it confused. I hadn't ordered anything off Amazon recently. In fact, I thought I uninstalled the app from my phone in an attempt to save myself from 1am impulse buys of weird kitchen gadgets I didn't need. Hey Ben, I said, did you buy something off Amazon? Yeah, socks, a colander, and a... Uh, what was it? Oh, those little rings that hold up shower curtains with the metal beads on them. No, that was last week. I'm talking about today. There's a package arriving. He furrowed his eyebrow. Oh, no. I didn't order anything since then. Did you? No. That's why I'm asking you. He frowned. Maybe Alexa ordered something by mistake. Does that happen? Yeah. A lot of people complain about it online. Of course. Another way for Amazon to reel in money. By making mistake orders. Whoops. You just spent $102.71 on a new stainless steel frying pan. With a huff, I pulled out my computer. I went to Amazon, clicked orders. There it was, an item, ordered a few days ago. But the product image was replaced with a standard gray text. No image available. The price box read, zero dollars. The title of the product read, unknown. Underneath, in green bold letters, it read, arriving today by 8 p.m. Hey Ben, look at this. His eyes glanced over the computer screen. Ooh, that's so weird. Probably just a glitch. He looked at me and I must have looked pretty upset, because he added, I wouldn't worry about it, Ellie. I waited for the doorbell to ring. Every time I heard the slightest thump or scuffling sound outside, I jumped and peered out the window to see if the package had arrived. But the afternoon passed without a vent. As the time approached 8pm and the package still hadn't arrived, I felt both disappointment and relief. I'd been excited to see what the mysterious package was, but also a bit freaked out over what appeared to be some sort of phantom Amazon order. But I guess it was a glitch. 
There never was any package that would be delivered. It was just an error in the system. Then, at 7.46 p.m., your package has arrived. I jumped off the couch and ran to the door as fast as my feet would take me. You okay, Ellie? Ben called, holding a cold slice of pizza. The package is here. Ooh, he said through a mouthful of congealed cheese. I thought it was just a digital glitch, but if they actually sent us a package we didn't have to pay for, awesome, free stuff. It's not awesome, it's weird. He followed me to the door, practically dancing. My hands fell to the knob, shaking. I shouldn't be nervous. I scolded myself. Mail mix-ups happen all the time. Ben's right. This is good. It's free stuff. Free stuff is always good. I yanked the door open. There it was. A brown box. About a foot on a side. Sealed shut with blue tape. I bent over and picked it up. It was much heavier than I expected. Here, I'll take it. Ben said. We brought it to the kitchen. Set it down on the island. He grabbed a butter knife. Ready? He asked. I guess. He plunged it through the tape. Pulled open the flaps. What the hell? He said. Backing away from it. It was empty. I was staring at an ordinary cardboard box. Slightly frayed and bent in places. Held together with that blue tape. I circled around the island. Staring inside. As if something might suddenly materialize out of thin air. But it was heavy. I finally said. How could it be empty? I thought it was going to be something really good, like a boombox. Ben replied sadly. A boombox? What is this, the 90s? He laughed. Hey, I would have been happy. He disappeared back into the living room. I grabbed the box and lifted it. It was light now. Normal. As my heart slowed, I folded the box up and tossed it in the recycling bin. All that fuss over an empty box. I woke up cold. I squinted at the clock. 3.34 AM. The window was wide open. Curtains billowing in the breeze. Damn it, I said, rushing up to close it. That's when I noticed the bed was empty. I whispered. I glanced at the bathroom. The light was off. The bedroom door hung wide open though, and a dim, golden light shone across the stairs. He was downstairs. I walked out into the hallway. It was even colder out there. I whipped around and noticed every bedroom door was open, and inside each, Every window was open. What kind of fuckery has Ben up to? Ben! I shouted. No reply. I sighed and started down the stairs. As I descended, I started to hear it. A repeating metallic noise that throbbed in my ears like a heartbeat. Damn it, Ben! What the hell are you? I froze. Ben was standing at the kitchen island, hunched over something. He didn't look up at me. His arm just moved back and forth, almost mechanically. He was sharpening knives. Every single knife we owned was divided into two piles on either side of him. He pulled that knife out of the sharpener and placed it in the right pile with a metallic clang. Then he picked up the next one a 12 inch long chef's knife and began sharpening that and then he stopped. I ducked behind the wall, holding a hand over my mouth. Ellie, 
He called from the kitchen. My lungs felt like they would burst. I have something to show you, he said. His voice was flat, almost monotone. His bare feet slapped against the tile, slowly and heavily as he walked towards me. I took in a slow, shuddering breath, extended my foot out in front of me, silently. Ellie? I ran. I took off down the hall. My feet slipped against the linoleum, but I forced myself forward, lungs burning. Ellie! He screamed. His voice was no longer light and kind. It was angry. I grabbed the keys off the hook. Then I opened the garage and ran into the driveway. His hawking form was silhouetted in the doorway. The knife gripped tightly in his hand. I dove into the car, locked the doors, started it up. The headlights washed over him, and his eyes glinted eerily in the light. For a moment, he was still. Then he ran towards the car, as fast as he could, knife raised in his hand, mouth open in an animalistic howl. I peeled out of the driveway. My mind raced. Ben had never been violent. Never. Maybe it wasn't what it looked like. Somehow he was innocent and I let my fears get the worst of me. I knew it was impossible, that there was no other explanation. I just didn't want to accept it. It wasn't until I pulled into the police station that I remembered the empty package. So heavy when we lifted it from the doorstep. So light after Ben opened it. Maybe the box wasn't empty at all. Maybe there was something inside. Something we couldn't see and we just let it free. At 3 a.m., I jolted awake to a sound outside. That was unusual for our Ohio farmhouse. We were surrounded in every direction by vast fields of corn, miles from the nearest neighbor, and I known if we left the gate open, or one of Madison's toys was out. I'd done my nightly check of the backyard about a thousand times. But as I lay there, still under the blankets, the noise continued. I ran to the window and threw back the curtains. The corn stretched out as far as the eye could see, rippling and churning like some great, dark ocean. It stopped just short of Madison's swing set casting long shadows onto the grass that nearly reached the back door. The stalks shifted and swayed, shaking the husks so hard they threatened to fall. David, there's something out there. Probably just a raccoon, he slurred, pulling the covers over his head. That's bigger than a raccoon, look at it. The corn rippled and roiled, as if something large was moving underneath. What if there's someone out there? I'm going to check the locks. You already checked them a million times, like you do every night. He groaned. Just go back to sleep. I didn't listen. I opened the door and stepped out of the room. No. At the end of the hall, Madison's door was hanging open. Maddie? I called, my voice shaking. And then I got that terrible feeling that only a parent knows. Something's terribly wrong. Sinking. Paralyzing. Throbbing in your chest. As you try to tell yourself, she's okay. Don't freak out. I'm sure she's fine. But she wasn't fine. The bed was empty. Madison? I ran out the back door into the yard. Madison, where are you? I screamed out into the night. The corn was still. Now that I was out there, I saw the evidence. Little bare footprints in the mud, leading up to the cornfield's edge. Where they disappeared, the corn was slightly trampled. 
Two stalks leaned in opposite directions, as if forcefully pushed apart. Madison! I screamed as loud as I could, but I was met with only silence. David stumbled out after me. She must have just went out into the corn to explore or something. We'll find her, he said, his tone barely convincing. He pulled out his phone, turned on the flashlight, and squeezed himself between the leaning stalks. Hey, Maddie, he yelled, with panic trembling his voice. I took a deep breath and squeezed in after him. The corn scratched my body. My legs were shaking so badly. Every step threatened to send me tumbling into the mud. The white orb of David's flashlight hovered a few feet in front of me. But other than that, the cornfield was pitch black. I was about to collapse with panic when the corn thinned out. And then we were in what appeared to be some sort of clearing or crop circle. The corn had been trampled into the ground in a small circle, roughly 10 feet in diameter. In the center stood Madison, facing away from us. Madison! I screamed. She didn't turn around. David was frozen, staring at her back, the flashlight shaking in his hand. Are you okay, Madison? I turned her around. No. I was staring at a blank face. A face made of burlap. A brown wig was stuck on top with safety pins. An Elsa shirt was stretched over the bloated waist of straw. The bottoms were put on backwards. I began to shake. Those are the pajamas I put her to bed in. My voice cracked. She wanted my little pony ones, but they were dirty and... and... What kind of sicko would do something like this? David said, his panic boiling into anger. He pulled out his phone and began dialing 911. The corn shook and shivered all around us. Shadows slowly coalescing between the stalks surrounding us in a ring of black. And then, before I could react, a hand shot out between the dark stalks. It grabbed David by the arm. He lost his balance and toppled backwards, his phone flying to the ground. David! A cold hand latched onto my waist. I was yanked into the corn. My back hit the cold mud. The corn scratched and poked at my sides. Get off of me! I screamed, swatting blindly at the stalks. Black slowly faded into hues of indigo and gray as my eyes adjusted to the darkness. And then I could see them, interrupting the vertical pattern of the corn stalks. There were several short shadows standing over me. Then the whispers started hissing, hurried whispers that seemed to generate the very wind that blew through the stalks. The corn shivered and shook, and then a heavy silence filled the air. I tried to scream, but quickly realized one of them had tied something over my mouth. But then I heard it, and my heart soared. 911, what's your emergency? A tiny voice, breaking through the silence. I pulled my neck up and through the stalks, I saw the white light of the phone, glowing against the trampled corn. Mmph, mmph. I tried to scream through the gag. It didn't work. Similar grunts several feet away from me rung out in the night. David. A low rumbling sound filled the air. The corn shook above me, harder than I'd seen it all night. Stretching and swaying, stalks wildly crashing into each other. And as the voice continued, 911, hello, what's your emergency? A loud rush rang, like an airplane flying right overhead, filled my ears. 
I looked up just in time to see the lights, red, purple, and green, blinking in an odd asynchronous pattern. The scarecrow, wearing Maddie's clothes, was enveloped in white light, and then, with a deafening hiss, it was yanked up into the night. I looked back at my captors, and the strange flashing lights, their faces were illuminated, and I saw they weren't terrors, monsters, or murderers. They were children, horribly disfigured children. Some were missing noses, others had long scars running straight down their faces, as if someone had split open their heads to explore what was inside. Quite a few were missing ears, and one had no teeth. All of them had profound sadness in their eyes, except for the one to my left, who had no eyes. But they were also smiling just a little. As the light disappeared and the faces faded back into the shadows, the hands on me loosened. The gag fell away. The shadows receded into the corn. Except for one. Mommy! With a squeal, two warm arms wrapped around my waist. Maddie! Oh my god, Maddie! I began to sob, hugging her tighter than I ever have in my life. Are you okay? And... Maddie? The broken, hopeful voice of David sounded to my left. He ran over to us. I'm fine, Daddy. Let's get out of here, he said, grabbing both of our hands and yanking us back through the corn. We ran back into the house, locking the doors and calling the police. Madison was in a different set of clothes. One's dirty, smudged with mud, and riddled with holes. But she was smiling, safe and happy. They saved me, Mommy. She kept saying, tugging on my arm. The bad men were gonna get me, but they tricked them. As the police were taking our statements, as the sun was cresting over the corn, Maddie stood at the back door. Bye bye, she said waving wildly at the cornfield. I first noticed it in the kitchen. My sister was putting the final touches on a batch of Christmas cookies. Turning to get more icing, she bumped a plate with her hip, and it flew into the ground. Oh, gosh darn it. Uh... What? Gosh darn it. I chuckled. Who are you and what have you done with my sister? Brittany stared at me blankly. Look, I know my sister. She swears like a 50 year old sailor drunk on cheap beer. Ruining an hour's work of cookie making should have at least elicited a fuck. But it didn't. Ah, I see. This an act for Jonathan? I winked at her. Don't worry, I won't tell. What are you talking about? She asked. I bent down, picking up shattered pieces of cookie. You know, your constant swearing, your secret's safe with me. I reached for another piece of cookie, picked it up, threw it towards the garbage. Instead of falling in, it ricocheted off the edge. Ah, fuck. I froze. At the exact moment I said fuck, a car horn had blared outside, drowning it out completely. I frowned. Fuck. Another car horn. Fuck, fuck, fuckity fuck. A strangely loud flock of geese caught outside the window. What the? A dog barked. Is going on here? I stared at Brittany, eyes wide. She ignored my question. We have to bake more cookies. She continued, as if I hadn't said anything. If the Christmas celebration tonight doesn't impress Christopher, 
he's going to shut down the community center forever. The community center? When have you given a... A train whistled about the community center. Since I started Woofies. What? You know, my business. Baking dog Christmas cookies. I frowned. These cookies are for dogs? She nodded. Okay, look. What has gotten into you? I stood up, brushing the crumbs off my hands. You don't even like dogs. You say they make too much noise and poop everywhere. You don't even like animals, period. Or kids. That reminds me. Christopher's nephew is going to be at the celebration. He's an orphan and he loves dogs too. I think I'm going to surprise him with a puppy from the shelter. I stared at her. Uh, what? It's going to be so awesome. Don't you love Christmas? I threw up my hands. You're acting really weird right now. I'm going to, uh, go rest for a while, okay? She nodded, eyes wide and a perky smile on her face. That's when I noticed something else. She wasn't wearing her usual outfit of a black tank top and skin tight jeans. Instead, she was wearing a bright red sweater and a neat skirt. Her hair, which was usually tied up in a messy bun, fell in perfect, loose waves around her face. You're dressed weird, I muttered. She just smiled back at me. I trudged out of the kitchen, through the family room. I was about to climb the stairs when I stopped. Something's different. Well, for one, my mom's house was clean, which was super weird, because she's a borderline hoarder who keeps everything from 20-year-old Christmas cards to free pens. The clutter was gone, a fire was going in the fireplace, and a fluffy red throw pillow sat across the sofa. Weird. But there was something else. My gaze caught on the mantle above the fireplace. Even from a distance, I could tell the photos were different. I'd seen the photos there a million times. The dorky photo of me embraces I hated. The photo of the four of us and our cat. They were burned into my brain. Not one of the familiar photos remained. I stepped closer, studying the photos. A girl with braces playing outside. A mother and a father sitting on a sofa. Two toddlers between them. Two girls holding hands while sitting on a swing. My heart dropped. Every muscle in my body paralyzed. They weren't us. They looked like stock photos. Stock photos of a family that roughly, very roughly, resembled ours. I ran up the stairs, my head spinning, my throat dry. What's going on here? Nothing made sense. Not the way Brittany was acting. Not the way she was dressed. Not my mom's house. Not our photos. It all clashed in my brain, so wrong. I collapsed into the bed. The bed of my childhood room. The only thing that felt familiar in this house. My stuff had been boxed up long ago, but the walls were still the shade of lavender I picked out in middle school. The bedspread was still deep purple. The mattress was still soft as a feather. I lay in the silence. Funny how now there were no random car horns or flocks of Canadian geese. I was almost drifting off to sleep when I heard it. Footsteps in the hallway. Brittany? I called. But they sounded louder, heavier, like a man's footsteps. I shot up in bed, my heart pounding. Our father had passed away several years ago. Christmas dinner wasn't for a few days. Too early for my uncles to be here. I backed away, heart drumming in my chest. 
Hello? I called out. The footsteps paused. Who's there? I shouted. The footsteps resumed. Closer now. So close that they were right outside the door. Brittany! I shouted, hoping she could hear me. Brittany, there's someone. The door opened. My voice died in my throat. A man stood there. A naked man with only a small towel wrapped around his waist. He stared at me with dark, hungry eyes. Then he smiled. Hey honey, are you okay? I screamed. Honey, what's wrong? The man was rushing towards me. I ducked underneath his overstretched arms and ran to the door. Down the stairs. Out the front door. I heard Brittany shouting behind me, but I didn't listen. I kept running and running. In a few blocks, I reached town. But it wasn't our town. It was a cutesy little town that time forgot. With shops lining the sidewalk and tinsel strung up between the street lamps. Gone were the liquor stores, rowdy teenagers, an endless supply of litter. And yes, there was even a community center. But not our community center of stained concrete and smashed beer bottles in the parking lot. No, it was now a darling brick building. A Christmas candle burning in each window. No, no, this can't be. What the fuck is happening? I hurried forward. As I walked, snowflakes began to fall from the gray sky. A few landed on my bare arms. They didn't melt. Hey, I called out to the nearest person. A woman waiting to cross the street. With perfect wavy hair and a bright red peacoat. Hey, can you help me? She turned towards me. A smile plastered on her face. Of course. What do you need? I don't think I belong here. This isn't... This isn't my town. It's... I faltered. Her grin had faded. She now stared at me. Face set in stone. Eyes burning with hatred. Then she took a step towards me. I ran. And that brings us here. I've been hiding out behind a perfectly decorated Christmas tree in someone's yard. Don't worry. The house isn't actually occupied. Despite all the cute lights and candy canes. I looked in the windows. The house is completely empty on the inside. So I'm safe. For now. But I don't think it'll be long. There's a ring on my left ring finger probably belonging to the man back at my parents' house. He'll probably call the police around here and tell them I'm missing, that I seem mentally unstable, that I should be apprehended immediately. At least, the internet seems to work, but calling Brittany's number and my mom's has only resulted in static. All I can do now is ask for your help. If you turn on your TV and see a Christmas movie featuring a short girl with a mole on her right cheek and an ACDC t-shirt, that's me. Help me. Please. Help me leave this place before it's too late. Feeling tired. Stressed. Take a virtual reality vacation. That's what the billboard said on the way from Franklin to Country Springs. At the moment, Finn was screaming bloody murder in the backseat because he dropped his car. Aaron was listening to Jason Mraz's I'm Yours and head bopping to the beat. I was driving. My right foot stiff and my left one numb. Let's take a vacation. What? We can't afford a vacation. What about a virtual one? I asked, pointing to the billboard. He scrunched his face at me. No way. That stuff is dangerous. 
They say some guy played some game on it, and then he gonna tell reality from the game, and straight out murdered some people. Wasn't that Cards Against Humanity? Oh, well, still, all those games are the same. No, they're not. I drove the rest of the way home in silence. When I got home, I handed Finn to Aaron. He needs a diaper change. But I went up to our room, pulled out my laptop, and typed in the website. Stunning photos of beaches filled the screen. Aquamarine waters. Palms swaying in the breeze. Bold black text read. Plan your virtual reality vacation for only $39. I scrolled down after a large ad for something called the Love Simulator. I found more information. Five reasons to book a virtual reality vacation. Number one, it's cheap. Number two, no jet lag. Number three, no bug bites. Number four, no sunburn. Number five, no embarrassing bathing suit mishaps. Pack for three days, but don't worry. Time travels differently in our virtual reality system. You'll feel like you had a full two week vacation. I clicked a big red button. Book now. Aaron, I said, walking into the kitchen, which reeked of baby poop. I'm going away to see mom for a few days. He lit up. Oh, that's just great. Without Finn. What? You two will be okay without me, right? I, I guess. Mama, mama, Finn said, smiling at me. I leaned in and kissed his forehead. I would miss his sweet, smiling face. But I needed this. I couldn't remember the last time I had a day to myself. I'd been stuck for almost two years in the rut of dirty diapers and tantrums. Even just taking a 15 minute shower felt like a luxury. When are you leaving? He asked. Tomorrow morning. Okay. He reached over the mess of poop and gave me a hug. I'm sorry if I made you sad. I didn't mean to. In the car. I shook my head. It's okay. I'm not mad, Aaron. I just need to get away. He nodded. I'll miss you, he added, as I climbed the stairs to pack. I'll miss you too. The building was not what I expected. Suite 4A, in a dilapidated office building. The few suites next to it were empty. The wallpaper torn where the business placards once hung. I raised my fist and knocked three times. Come in. My doubt evaporated as soon as I walked in. The office was modern and professional. It mildly resembled the doctor's office, with the secretary behind sliding glass panels and tiled floor. Danica Kelly, I said. She clacked at the keys. You may go into room three, she said in a perky, chipper voice. I followed the white halls to the room. A leather recliner stood in the middle, next to a small desk, a laptop, and a headset. A tall blonde woman came in after me. Please, have a seat, she said in the most soothing voice I've ever heard. So Danica, are you ready for your vacation? Yes, I groaned. Please, I need this. I have a toddler. She laughed. I know how it is. Don't even feel like yourself, right? Exactly. She laughed. Well, don't worry. You will be so refreshed after it, your family won't even recognize you. She picked up the headset and lowered it over my face. Just relax. She cooed. 
The image of a sunny beach faded in. Aquamarine water. Palms swaying in the breeze. Relax. The vacation was incredible. I sunbathed on a private island. Built a castle on pink Bahama sand. Swam with dolphins. Snorkeled in a coral reef. Pet a turtle. And it all felt so real. The two weeks went by all too soon. Before I knew it, I was watching the sun rise over the ocean, waiting for my 11 a.m. checkout time. Surprisingly though, I wasn't sad. In fact, I was happy. I can't wait to hug Finn again. And Aaron. I smiled to myself and imagined Finn sitting on the floor, playing with his cars. Vroom! Vroom! He'd say, pushing them along the carpet. When I walked in, he'd look up at me and say, Mama! Mama! And that was more beautiful than any sunrise, real or not. Soon enough, the credits rolled up on the screen. Thank you for choosing Virtual Reality Vacation. We hope you enjoyed your stay. Beep. Beep. Click. The headset loosened. I reached up to pull it off. My arms felt surprisingly stiff and achy. And a sharp pain jabbed me inside my elbow. I guess I have been sitting here in this chair for three days. The headset came off. What? The room looked different, dilapidated, old. The clean white paint was peeling. The floor was cracked. Hello? I called. I'm done. No reply. I started to get up. The sharp pain jabbed me in my elbow again. I looked down. My heart stopped. A needle was taped to the skin. Leading from it was a thin tube that curled and coiled up to the ceiling. Some sort of fluid passed through it. Hey, is anyone there? I shouted. Silence. I ripped it out with a yelp of pain. I looked down again. My pants were gone. I was instead covered with a thin sheet. Two more tubes snaked out from under it. I ripped those out too, whimpering in pain. Then I hobbled up, walked over to the door. I yanked it open. The hallway was in the same state of despair, peeling pain, cracked floor. What the hell is going on? I ran out into the waiting room. It was empty. I ran down the stairs, out into the parking lot. The asphalt cracked and buckled. Weeds poked through. My car was gone. What the hell is happening? I pulled out my phone. It was dead. I walked onto the sidewalk. Cars whizzed past me. I walked until I reached the main road. I held my hand out for a taxi, but none passed. Finally, a pickup truck rumbled to a stop next to me. Hey lady, the guy said. Need a ride? Oh, no, I'm just waiting for a taxi. Taxis don't come here no more, he said. Come on, hop in. Where are you going? Uh, Monmouth Place? It's out of my way, but I'll take you there. I weighed my options. It was cold outside. My phone was dead. There were no taxis. I opened the door and climbed in. We drove in silence, only broken by loud smacks of chewing gum. Finally, we pulled up to the small ranch on the cul-de-sac. Thanks for the ride. No problem, ma'am. I stepped out. I grabbed my keys and put them into the lock. They didn't fit. I jammed them in again. Not even close. Aaron? Aaron? Can you let me in? 
I called. My keys don't fit, and the door creaked open. A woman I didn't recognize stood there. Who are you? She snapped, eyes narrowed. Who the hell are you? I shouted back. My confusion boiled into anger. No, gone for three days, and he's invited some woman over? Hell no. Where's Aaron? An 11 or 12 year old boy peered out from behind the woman. Oh, are you the new male lady? Where's Aaron? I asked again. Thump, thump. Footsteps thudded inside the house. The tall, lanky shape of a man appeared. His eyes were sunken with wrinkles. His hair was peppered with gray. But it was undeniably Aaron. As soon as he saw me, he went pale. Danica, what are you doing here? Where's Finn? I asked, my voice shaky. What's going on? I'm Finn. The boy piped up. No. What? Aaron stepped out onto the porch and closed the door behind him. You can't just come back here. After so long. What are you talking about? The last ten years. He shouted. His voice halfway between a scream and a sob. Why did you leave, Danny? Why? We were happy. We were a family. I stared at him, confused and terrified. The first few weeks, Finn cried for you every day, and if I'm honest, so did I. But I guess you didn't even care. I do care. I didn't. No. His eyes glittered in the light. Now I finally have a good life, a good family. Don't take that away from me. Aaron, I... No, I'm done. He walked back into the house and slammed the door. Inside, I saw Finn smiling at his new mom, eagerly grabbing a sandwich. It was Finn. The upslanting brown eyes, the olive skin, the pointed nose. Not a baby anymore. Grown up. I missed everything. I started away from the house. Missing the clumsy toddler hugs Finn used to give me. The cold wind nipped at my face, my hands. The snow crunched under my feet. I waited until the sun sunk behind the trees, until Aaron and his new wife were in bed. Then I went in through the back door. He always left it unlocked and crept up the stairs. I can't believe he just married some new woman his wife, and Finn's new mom. I felt the heat rush to my face as I stepped towards the bedroom. He never cared for me. The door creaked open. I stepped inside. Finn slept peacefully under the covers. Various awards and diplomas hung on the wall. Things I'd never been part of. Things I missed. I covered his mouth. Then I pulled him out of bed. I dragged him down the stairs. He thrashed and wiggled against me. I didn't remove my hand until we were out in the cold night air. You're crazy, he yelled. Get away from me. I'm your mother, I said, dragging him by the hand. And you're coming with me. I went to the park this afternoon. I thought it was going to be a fun experience. I really did. But going out with an independent three-year-old is never a fun experience. Go off the path, he said. We went off the path, into the wet grass and mud. The mile-long trail surrounds a wide, open field that extends forever. It's beautiful to look at. Not so fun to actually walk in. Come on, let's get back on the path. I said gesturing. Of course, he turned the other direction and ran further into the field. Hey, come back here, now. 
I sprinted after him. My feet sank into the mud with a gross squelch. I could feel the water seeping into my boots, cold and damp. He 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 he. I finally caught up to him, panting. I grabbed him by the shoulder. We have to get back on the path, okay? No. I sighed and looked around. We were further out than I thought. Green grass extended in every direction, gently sloping into the hills and curves. A few trees spotted the landscape. The sky above was gray. Rain drizzled down, blurring the trail that looped around us. Well, shit. This was going to be a long, muddy, messy walk. Come on, I said, pulling him by the arm. We walked for a few minutes, then he abruptly stopped, bent over, and started taking off his left shoe. No. No, no, no. You have to keep those on. I bent down, grabbed the shoe, shook it out for rocks, and jammed it back on his foot. Sighing, I stood up. Huh? The trail looked farther away. No. No. It must be my imagination. I took his hand and we trudged forward. He made it difficult. He kept turning around, looking back over his shoulder at something. I kept my focus, as we mothers are so good at doing. When everything is going to shit, we just stare straight ahead, plowing forward. I kept my eyes locked on the blurry red dot of our car that looked so, so far away. What's that? He finally asked me. We're going to the car, I replied sternly, as if I could magically transport us there with my words. Is that a person? He twisted his whole body around, looking at something behind us. I kept my hand locked fast in his, trudging forward. My ears were freezing. My feet were wet. I could not lose focus. We're going to the car, I repeated through gritted teeth. Is that a person in the tree? Come on, we're going to the car. What's he doing? We're going to the... His little hand fell away from mine. A soft thud on the grass. Oh, buddy, I'm sorry. He'd slipped in the grass and was sitting now, staring behind us. Perhaps I've been too mean, pulling him forward like that. He was so preoccupied with whatever he was looking at, that he wasn't looking where he was going. I gently pulled him back up. I'm sorry, I just think we need to get to the car, now. It's cold. We forgot your hat, so your ears are going to hurt. And I looked up, my breath caught in my throat. There was a figure hanging by a rope on the tree behind us, limply swaying in the wind. What the hell? Every muscle in my body froze. For a second, I was paralyzed, just staring. The figure hung limply, dark in the shadows of the branches, unmoving. It can't be real. Yeah, of course. How would a dead body just be hanging there, in daylight, for the world to see? There'd been a few joggers on the trail. Clearly, they would have seen it and called the cops. And in the drizzling rain at this distance, I couldn't see any details. It was most likely some stupid prank or a belated Halloween decoration. What's the person doing? My son continued staring at the figure. Don't. Don't worry. It's just some stupid joke. I took his shoulders and turned him around. Grabbed his hand. Marched forward. Without looking back. The wind whipped towards us. Spraying rain in our faces. I squinted. Fighting through. My toes ice cold and numb. I forced my eyes on the parking lot. 
focusing on that little red dot in the distance. But the dot grew no closer. We walked for 5 minutes, then 10, then 20. Every step we took, the path was still so far away. Finally, we stopped. I glanced around in every direction. We were still in the middle of the field. The tree was far behind us. I could barely make out the figure hanging from its branches. But the path was still as far as it ever was. How is that even possible? I glanced around hopelessly, trying to figure out which part of the path was the closest. Which direction to go in. But it seemed like we were in the dead center of the field. I want to go home, my son said, wrapping his arms around me. Fear pained in my chest. I knelt to his level and hugged him. I know, I want to go home too. We just need to walk a little longer. We continued walking. When he got too tired, I carried him in my arms. We walked for a half hour, then an hour. The trail stayed out of reach. I finally collapsed into the wet grass, giving up all hope. Then I saw the jogger. He was in the distance, plodding along the path slowly wearing a bright red windbreaker. I watched his path along the gravel trail. Then I screamed, Help! Please! Help us! He was far, but definitely not far enough away to hear someone screaming at the top of their lungs. Yet, he didn't turn around, just kept jogging along the path. The path that never seemed to get any closer. Help! I screamed. We can't get out. Please, come help us. He just kept going. It's getting dark now. We've been trapped here in the middle of the park for almost six hours. I'm scared and hungry. So is my son. We're huddled under a little cluster of trees, trying to stay warm. I've tried calling every emergency line from my phone, but I only get static. I'm not even sure this post will go through, but I hope something happens soon, because I hear noises, horrible sounds. The wind goes through the park, but in its wake, I hear whispers and snarls among the rustling of leaves, as if the park is coming alive. And that jogger? I'm not so sure he's just some random person, because he's still here running the loop around us for hours, never slowing down, never stopping for a break. And he's much closer than he was hours ago. I think he's off the path. I can't see him in the darkness, but I can hear him. Hear his ragged breaths. Hear his footsteps on the wet grass. Getting closer with every step. Amy, has anyone told you the legend of Morris Bridge yet? I rolled my eyes. Don't waste her time with that garbage. It's not garbage. It's a captivating legend. Jingwen said, leaning in from the back seat. In the 70s, a 13-year-old girl named Mary Ann lived on the west side of town. She was your average girl, except for one thing. She was completely blind. We turned onto a narrow dirt road flanked by deep forest. Because middle schoolers are terrible, she was teased endlessly and didn't have many friends. So, one warm fall day, when two of the girls in her class invited her to hang out on the bridge, she happily accepted. Aw, that's so nice of them, Amy said. Jingwen glared at her. No, it wasn't nice. It was a trick. When they got to the middle of the bridge, the two girls ran away, leaving her stranded. She called out for help. She cupped her hands and called, Help me, Amy, help me. 
Amy shivered. Jingguan grinned, a crooked, mischievous grin, and continued. Nobody heard her. Finally, she decided to try to make it back across the bridge by herself. Tragically, she took a wrong step and, thunk, plummeted into the waters below. And she drowned. The end. I said, great story, yay. Jingwen ignored me and leaned forward. Her voice was but a whisper in our ears. The tragic death turned poor sweet Mary Ann into a vengeful spirit. I felt Jingwen's breath on my neck and shuddered. They say if you stand in the middle of the bridge and close your eyes, she'll lead you safely to the other side of the bridge. But if you open your eyes, she grabbed Amy's shoulders. She'll push you in the river. Amy yelped. We're here, I said, rolling to a stop in front of the bridge. And no ghost. Just an abandoned, rotting, ugly bridge. Carter saw her once, Jingwen said, ignoring me completely. She was standing in the middle of the bridge, wearing a white dress. Carter also believes his house is haunted, I said, sees the lights flickering and stuff. Probably just needs a good electrician. Blair? Amy was scrunched down in her seat, scanning the bridge. What's wrong? I thought I saw. She trailed off. Jingwen, look what you did. Amy's so scared she's seeing things. If this is all nonsense to you, Blair, I dare you to go out there. What? You heard me. She poked me with her high heel. Go. Prove us all wrong. I looked at the bridge. Even I had to admit, it looked awfully creepy. The metal frame was rusted and grimy. The wood was gouged with rot. And the river, rushing below, was much larger and fiercer than I remembered. But my stubbornness got the better of me. Fine, I will. I slammed the door and stepped out into the night. The bridge rose up in the darkness, lit only by the headlights behind me and the half moon above. I felt a twinge of fear, but took a deep breath and stepped onto the bridge. Creak. The wood groaned in response. I slowly stepped towards the center of the bridge, one hand dangling on the wet railing. The girl's chatter faded replaced by the rush of the river below. My footsteps thumped on the wet wood. I reached the center of the bridge, shut my eyes, and tried to reassure myself. This is the easiest dare I'd ever done. Much easier than TPing Mr. Wilson's car, or doing a lap around the school in my pajamas. I shivered. Was it this cold when I left the car? Or that one time I pretended to be Carter's girlfriend. Yuck. I stopped. Over the rush of the water, over the rattling of the branches, I heard a faint sound, like something passing through the water, breaking the gentle waves. I laughed. Now I'm imagining things. Ha. Huh. Jingwen really has a way of getting to people. I smiled and grinned and laughed until my face was sore. Splash. The grin flew off my face. Just a fish, or a turtle. We have a lot of turtles around here, don't we? I told myself, don't let that stupid story get to you. I kept my eyes tightly shut. Splash. The air grew even colder. Thump. I felt the soft vibrations of the wood under my feet. Jingwen, I called. Silence. Oh, haha, very funny. You're going to sneak up on me. Give me a scare. How convenient that I have to keep my eyes closed. Thump, thump, dull thumps. 
not the sharp click of high heels. Amy, I said, uncertainly. The thumps grew louder. Stilted, uncertain footsteps. Hello? I called, my voice quavering. Thump, thump. I felt the air shift, and along with it, a terrible smell, like a dog or a pond that had been left to fester and decay. I shut my eyes tighter. Thump. The steps were loud now, just a few feet away. My heart pounded in my chest. My mouth was dry. Silence. I let out a long sigh of relief. It must have just been my imagination, or a wayward squirrel that now scurried into the bushes. How silly of me to actually think for a second that it might be a ghost of Mary Ann. I froze. I heard another sound, faintly, over the rush of the river. Drip. Drip. The sound of water dripping to the ground. I stood, paralyzed. I tried to move my legs, but I was frozen with fear. My heart pounded so loud it throbbed in my ears. Drip. Then a rustling sound. Cold. Wet. Brushing the back of my neck. Amy! Jigwen! I screamed, but the only response was the drips, the thumps, the rush of the river below. Don't open your eyes. Don't open your eyes. I chanted to myself, shaking with fear. Thump. Thump. The air shifted. The protrude smell filled my nostrils, and the cold, wet fingers brushed against my arm. Take her hand. Let her lead you across the bridge. But whatever you do, don't open your eyes. I stretched my arm out. It brushed something cold, smooth, bare. My heart pounded. My legs felt weak. The wet hand locked into mine, and then it tugged. I took an uncertain step forward, my legs shaking. Don't open your eyes. I chanted under my breath. Another step forward, and another. I tried not to think about the thuds of her feet, the drips of water of her body. I tried not to imagine what she looked like. A 13-year-old blind girl that drowned 40 years ago, waterlogged and decayed. I tried not to picture her face with milky white eyes that couldn't see, wrinkled blue skin from sitting in the water. My toe caught on something. I fell forward, and my eyes flew open. A flash of blue skin, tangled black hair, white eyes, and then nothing. I pushed myself up and sprinted down the bridge. Don't look back. The bridge seemed to stretch as I ran. The car, the grass, the dirt road only crawled towards me as my feet thumped across the wood. Only a few more steps, I told myself, as my lungs burned and my legs grew weak. Almost there, I heard the thud of her feet behind me, stilted and clumsy. Almost. The air grew ice cold. The decayed smell filled my nostrils. Almost. My feet hit the grass. I ran to the car, screaming, and slammed the door behind me. Blair? Are you okay? She's coming, I shouted, jamming the key into ignition. I'm so sorry. I couldn't help it. I tripped. A reflex. What are you talking about? Jingwen asked. I don't see anybody, Amy said. No, she was there, chasing me down the bridge. I screamed, pointing frantically. I looked up. The bridge was empty. My heart slowed. I sank back into the sea. You're right. 
I must have imagined it. I began to laugh. I really was terrified out there. All for nothing. I shifted into reverse, glancing at the backup camera. No. The blurry image of a figure standing right behind the car. A girl with white eyes. I pulled out fast, kicking up clouds of dirt. Hey, what? Slow down. Jingguan screamed. Amy was wailing, her hands over her eyes. I ignored them. They didn't see her. They didn't understand. I barreled down the road, not daring to look in the rearview mirror. We were almost to the main road, where there'd be street lights, stop signs, other cars. We'd be out of her territory. And somehow I knew, if I could just get there fast enough, she wouldn't follow. I hit the gas. Jingwen shrieked. Amy screamed. The car lurched, bouncing over the dirt violently. The intersection was up ahead. We were almost there. We flew towards the road, all of us screaming. We made it, I shouted. I glanced back at the dirt road, empty. I smiled as I walked up to the front door. Jingwen and Amy thought I was insane. The car had a couple new dents, but I was safe, and that was all that mattered. I clicked the keys into the lock. My heart was finally starting to slow. The pounding in my head was fading. I'll make some tea, I said to myself. That'll put me to sleep. I stepped into the foyer, humming to myself. My feet squelched on the floor. I looked down. It was wet. Come home. The message lit up my phone driving home from work. My wipers thrumming in the soft rain. The blue glow creating a halo around the phone on my dash. It was from Pa, of course. Only he typed in all caps as if yelling at the world. No matter how many times I corrected him, he insisted this was the only way anyone would be able to read the font tinier than an ant's asshole. I knew how much he hated texting, so I gave him a ring. No answer. I waited five minutes and tried again. Still no answer. Strange. My pa hates cell phones. About as useful as a bear with a rifle, he'd say. So he isn't one to use it unless necessary. If he sent a message and I called back, he always picked it up on the first ring. Concerned, I took the next exit, deciding to head out to the bunker. My folks are preppers. Someone who prepares to survive a major cataclysm they believe to be inevitable. They aren't crazy, but they sure can be odd. Especially if you can't look past the living stereotypes to the good souls underneath the peculiar. When I was 12, they decided to build a bunker a few clicks into the old woods that sat at the back of Uncle Bob's cabin. He was Ma's older brother and my favorite family member. Every weekend, all through high school and a fair way into college, they would trudge with their tools into the forest and work on the bunker. It sat on a tract of land on the outskirts of a sprawling forest reserve. Sometimes Uncle Bob lent a hand, and sometimes I did too. But I hated that forest. Hated the chirps, cheeps, and buzzing of invisible insects. The scampering of feet on forest floor from critters I could never catch but from the side of my eye. One critter in particular made my skin crawl. It made a raspy, grating sound like two pieces of wood slowly rubbing together deliberately. A sound I sometimes heard outside my room when I slept in the cabin. One you can only hear as twilight began to drape the trees at night. A few months ago, when the bunker was complete, my parents decided to rent out our family home and move into it. Despite my protests, Pa, 
You've got to be kidding. I had said disbelievingly. You can't live in some hole in the ground. Why? Ain't I as good as them hobbits you yap on about? A bunker is not a home. Tell him, Ma. I pleaded with my mother. She shrugged and smiled. Home is wherever Pa is. Wherever you are, pumpkin. The bunker gives us something to work on and it's easier to live in than haul ass between two places. There ain't no difference between stubborn folk and a mountain. Once a thought gets lodged in. Which is why I had to drive to the edge of the woods and then slog my way through the wet mud and growing dark just to check on my parents. Uncle Bob didn't believe in phones either, so calling him to go instead wouldn't have done a lick of good. The forest was unnervingly quiet in the twilight. Reaching the bunker, I spun the wheel and yanked the hatch door open. The hole looked like a cavernous mouth in the murky earth, eager to swallow me up whole. An abyss gaped at the bottom of the ladder. No light or sound fleeing outside. Ma? Pa? I called out. The inky black swallowed up my words. No reply. I was starting to get scared. My fear of the dark battling against fear for my parents. It was nearly impossible that there wasn't a light source active. Even if the solar powered batteries had run dry and the generator failed. There were candles, gas lamps, and plenty of flashlights. Something had to be extremely wrong for them to be sitting in pitch black and to ignore me. Silently, I thanked Pa for his proper planning. At my refusal of a go bag, he had bought me a keychain that had a mini flashlight, mini pepper spray, and a compact Swiss army knife. It was bulky but over the years had been helpful in unexpected situations. The light from the torch wasn't powerful, but it would adequately cut through the gloom to let me locate my folks. Turning it on, I began cautiously descending the ladder. The bunker was T-shaped with the trunk housing the living area and kitchen, the right fork with two bedrooms and a bath, and the left the pantry, storage and power, I swept the flashlight around the living area and kitchen, but nothing seemed out of place. It all looked perfectly normal, much as I had seen it two weeks ago when I helped them move in. Ma? Pa? Are y'all okay? I called out anxiously. Still, no answer. Walking deeper into the bunker felt like crawling into the depths of an ancient horror. The shadows cloaked me wrapping me in their embrace, with the only visible parts of the bunker being where the paltry light from my torch illuminated. I couldn't see anything to my left or right, just what was directly ahead. Where the fork split into different sections, I paused, hesitant to pick a path to investigate. The feeling of being watched had been gradually slithering up my spine and the idea of walking in one direction only to have something slink up behind me from the other, was starting to trigger my flight response. Just as I made a choice and was about to walk towards the bedrooms, I heard it. A sound like two pieces of wood slowly rubbing together deliberately. Pure, numbing terror washed over me. I swung my torch in the direction of the noise, but it took endless seconds for the thing in the dark to creep into the frail light. When I saw what the shadow once hid, I began to scream. My parents came towards me, or what was once my parents. A rictus grin froze on their faces, a smile so wide it would have to hurt to hold. Loving eyes now replaced with two hollow sockets, from which malice shone dully in its empty depths. Their heads were tilted to the side as if they were somehow curious about what I was. The worst. The worst was the sound. Because I finally understood what made it. My parents didn't walk anymore. One foot in front of the other. Instead, each leg lifted straight up from its socket. 
rotating slowly to come down an inch in front, the arm on the same side mimicking the motion. The sound I'd heard in the forest at night, outside my room, and now from my parents wasn't that of two pieces of wood rubbing together. It was the sound of bone scraping on bone. I stumbled, falling backwards in my fright, but recovered quickly enough to get up and run towards the open hatch door. I heard the sound increase in rhythm as the thing behind me picked up speed. Scrambling up the ladder, I was nearly at the top when I felt a grasping hand on my ankle. Shrieking like a banshee, I kicked back as hard as I could, my leg connecting with its face. Only instead of hitting bone, my foot began to sink into Pa's face, like a foot squelching into soft mud. I was now more panic than person and yanked back my leg. I twisted myself around, wrenching my leg free from its grasp. I don't know how I managed it, but I clambered up the ladder backwards at inhuman speed, refusing to turn my back on it. Once outside, I slammed down the hatch and began to run towards my truck. Suddenly the woods exploded with sound, the rasping discordant sound of rubbing bone and enveloped me from all sides, rapidly closing in on my direction. In a last burst of adrenaline, I sprinted to the truck, skidding to a halt. I jumped in and turned the key, thanking all the gods when the sweet rattle of my engine kicked in immediately. The joy was short-lived. My headlights ripped into the darkness illuminating rows on rows of things in front of me. Hollow sockets set deep in contorted faces, tilted at an angle. They shambled toward me with their strange walk, attempting to surround the truck. But as the strong glare of my headlights touched them, they rattled in pain, vaulting back and up into the comfort of the looming trees. Putting my truck in reverse, I drove at a breakneck speed to my Uncle Bob's cabin, ignoring the niggling feeling that I had forgotten something really important. Hammering on the door until Uncle Bob finally opened it, I stumbled in and banged it shut. What in the world, pumpkin? exclaimed Uncle Bob in astonishment. Feeling safe for the first time that night, I sat in front of the door and began to cry as my uncle tried to comfort me despite his confusion. It had finally dawned on me that my parents were dead. My weird, frustrating, wonderful, loving parents were dead. No, worse than dead. They were now monsters. At this thought, I began to howl through my tears, unable to really comprehend the depth of what I had lost or how to process what happened. It took an age for my racking sobs to transform into a trickle of tears. Finally, able to catch my breath and speak with a level of normalcy, I told Uncle Bob what had transpired. He listened patiently while I narrated the events, holding on to his thoughts until I was done. I don't rightly know what you saw or what you think you saw. I ain't saying I don't believe you. Far from it. There's a lot in these here woods that are older than folk, and a lot more that are far more dangerous. I ain't promising your pa and ma are alright, but it's best I go and look over things come morning, just to be sure. Don't you fret now, pumpkin. What you need is sleep, and plenty of it. You head on up to bed, and let's see what the light of day brings us. Should we call the cops? I asked. Don't be Egypt, he replied tersely. What if your head was being loony and you decided to bring down the blue on your pa's bunker for no reason? You'd get a hinder so fine it would turn you back into a tot. I smiled weakly at that. Uncle Bob always could chase away my deepest mopes. I kissed him on his cheek and headed up the stairs to the guest room. Which brings us to here. With me sitting in the dark holding a shotgun. I had been all set to climb into bed when the niggling sensation at the back of my mind finally wriggled free. Pa had installed a classic bunker hatch door, 
One that didn't lock properly unless the wheel was spun. In my haste to escape, I had slammed it down but hadn't turned the wheel. So pushing it from underneath would easily lift it open. The things inside the bunker weren't trapped there. So while Uncle Bob's going around shutting windows, locking doors, and dragging furniture to create barricades, I'm typing this out. The lights died a smidge back, and my phone won't call out. Small blessing I reckon, that I've just enough signal to get out this call for help. If you're willing and you aren't afraid, we're in an old brick cabin inside Christopher Forest. 20 clicks past Highway 118. Turn right at the broken tree stump by the creek and drive up the muddy path. There are four hours until sunrise and the sound of bones had steadily grown louder. A dreadful cacophony slowly encircled the cabin. The last message on my phone reads, Coming home. How do you explain to the police that your girlfriend, the woman that you live with, the woman who has been with you and only you last night, is now dead. Stone cold dead. Not only that, but how is it that she no longer has a face? Well officer, I know her head looks like a pound of raw hamburger meat, but it's beyond me how it got that way. I don't think so. Or maybe, honestly sir, the doctors told me she'd make it after the motorcycle accident, but I guess they discharged her too early. Fat chance. How do you explain the strange events that led up to this without them immediately thinking you're guilty as sin? Even if you're not, I honestly have no idea, but I'm going to try here first. Tell me how I do. For the past two weeks, we had birds nesting in the wall behind our bed. They chirped and squawked and made such a racket, even at night, that it became nearly impossible to sleep. I started by banging on the wall with my fist. That worked at first. They'd shut up for a while and then I'd have to bang on the wall again. But they soon realized that, while loud and scary, the pounding wasn't going to hurt them, so they just kept on making noise, noise, noise. We just tried putting up with it, thinking either they'd move out soon or we'd just get used to the ruckus and sleep right through it. But nope. Just when we started to drift into rapid eye movement, a loud burst of caws, squawks, and flapping would wake us from our slumber. My eyes were becoming perpetually red. My meetings at work even more contentious than usual. The final straw came when the baby birds hatched. The bothersome racket turned into a non-stop chorus of desperate and demanding peeping. If sleep was difficult before, it was downright impossible now. Had clawing my ears off been a viable option, I may have resorted to it. The next day, I called an exterminator and gave him a rundown of the situation. We scheduled an appointment. A gruff, older man showed up a few days later. He climbed up on a ladder on the outside of the wall and had a look inside the small hole. Great, these are the kind you can still kill. Well, I guess that makes it easier. I responded. Oh yeah. We'll just close off the hole with some aluminum paneling, and that'll be that. So they just slowly die inside the wall? Yup. It'll probably stink like hell for a bit, but it'll pass. Alright. I guess if that's how it's done. He went ahead and put a small square of metal across the opening. It was painted brown to match the natural wood color of our siding. You could barely see it unless you knew it was there. The cheeping continued in the wall for about another three days. Outside, you could see the mother bird searching desperately for the opening, trying to bring food to her young. On the fourth day, all the noise had stopped. 
They had gotten much quieter the day before, obviously growing very weak. But now it was all over for them. They had slowly starved to death inside the wall. Outside, the mother had given up and moved on. It was a pretty awful fate when you thought about it. Just a bunch of tiny, helpless little creatures that never got a chance at life. Slowly dying inside that dark space. I tried to keep my mind off of it. That, and the fact that there were now a bunch of tiny skeletons forever entombed inside the wall, just behind where we slept. As the exterminator said, the area began to smell awful. The odor of rotting flesh seeping through the drywall into our bedroom. We had to sleep on the couches for the next few nights. Finally, the smell subsided and life could finally go back to normal. At least, that's what I thought. After a few nights of normal sleep, I began to dream that something was pecking and biting at my head and scalp. I'd wake up, slap at the top of my head, then realize nothing was there. I told my girlfriend about it and she said it hadn't happened to her and she had no idea. She said I was probably feeling guilty for killing the baby birds and imagining things. I figured she was probably right and decided to forget it. I went on with my day as normal. The next night, however, I awoke to a particular painful biting sensation on my scalp. I jumped up in bed and yelled out, Christ, what the fuck was that? What happened? Are you okay? My girlfriend cried. I think I really got bit this time. You're just imagining it, she said, turning the bedside lamp on. See, there's nothing in here but you and I. I put my fingers to my head where I had felt the bite, and my fingers touched something wet and warm. I brought my hand in front of my eyes to see. It was blood. I showed her my hand with an... I told you so. Look at my face. You probably just bumped your head on the headboard while you were sleeping. Lord knows, you've been tossing and turning like a madman lately. Whatever, I said, but I'm not sleeping in this fucking room anymore. Alright, we'll enjoy the couch. She fired back. That old thing always makes my back hurt like hell in the morning. I said goodnight and went downstairs. I laid down and almost immediately fell into a deep and dreamless sleep. The next morning, I got up and went into the kitchen for my coffee. My girlfriend was still in bed, but that was nothing unusual as she normally sleeps later than me. I drank my coffee, watched the news and had a bagel with cream cheese for breakfast. Around 9am, I realized she still wasn't up. She normally got out of bed around 8.30 to get ready for work at 10. If she slept much longer, she'd be late. Irritably, I pried myself off the couch, second coffee in hand, and headed up the stairs. Hey sleepy woman, time to get up or you're going to be late for work. I called on my way up, but there was no reply. She must have been really out. I got to the top of the stairs, knocked loudly on the door, then immediately began to open it. Rise and shh. I dropped my coffee on the floor, shattering the mug and spilling the hot brown liquid everywhere. There, in the bed, was the dead body of my girlfriend. Her hands were frozen with rigor mortis in front of her face in a last ditch defensive posture. Her nose, cheeks, lips, eyes and throat had all been pecked out and eaten. I called 911 reflexively. Even though there was nothing they could do and I'd likely be the one to take blame. So anyways, as I write this, I can hear the sirens coming. I still have no idea what I'm going to tell them when they get here. Maybe. No officer, it wasn't me. It was the evil demon ghost birds that live in my walls. 
No, I didn't think so either. Well, if you have any ideas, I'd love to hear them. I'm sure they're pretty better than mine. Just make sure to type them fast. I don't know if they have internet in prison. I found Mr. Giggles in a dumpster behind what was once a magic store. I'd always thought ventriloquist dummies were lame, but there was always something different about him. The moment he slid onto my arm, I felt this power. It was as though cascading waves of energy were running through my entire body. I felt strong, confident, complete. In the months that followed, Ventriloquism became my new obsession. I bought countless books on the subject. This was before you could just look things up on YouTube and practiced morning, noon, and night. Mr. Giggles and I became inseparable. You can imagine my surprise when he sprang to life one evening. I'd asked Sidney Lawrence to the dance earlier that day. It didn't go well, but Darren, she replied, I heard you were already taking someone. You did? I asked innocently. Yeah. Aren't you going with your doll? Her friends erupted with laughter. Later, as I cried into my pillow, Mr. Giggles spoke. Are you just going to sit back and take that from some dumb broad? I sat up and wiped my tears. M Mr. Giggles, did you just talk? My hand operated him all on its own. Who does this chick think she's messing with? He said. Embarrassing you in front of everybody like that? His head completed a full rotation. We gotta get her for this. Nobody talks to my best friend like that. Nobody. What followed was an elaborate scheme to dump 20 pounds of manure on top of Sydney at the Spring Fling Dance. Mr. Giggles masterminded it, obviously, and his plan went off without a hitch. It took her three weeks to get rid of the smell. From that point on, Mr. Giggles spoke nonstop, insisting we exact revenge for even the slightest indiscretion. And after that, we graduated to petty crimes, theft, graffiti, vandalism. I wanted to stop. He had this hold on me. Sometimes it felt as though I was the puppet. Even when we were apart, I heard this voice inside my head, ordering me how to act. One afternoon, as we were walking home, Miss Wendell's cat lunged at us. You wanna go furball? Mr. Giggle shouted. I begged him to stop. Honest, I did. Miss Wendell's cat was a mean old thing, but that doesn't justify what Mr. Giggles did. And when he put his handiwork on display for the whole neighborhood to see, I knew things had officially gone too far. I locked him inside a hamper and stashed it in the attic. The end. Except it wasn't the end. Not by a long shot. Without Mr. Giggles, I was like a junkie going through a withdrawal. My arm felt incomplete. My mood hit such a low, even my absentee parents recognized something was wrong and sent me to a psychologist. I told her everything, even the part about Miss Wendell's cat. She insisted, Mr. Giggles was my coping mechanism and that his actions were really just me acting out. Think back to those times he took control, she said. Before he did, were you feeling scared or angry or upset? I paused for a moment. Well, yeah. And did it make you feel better seeing Mr. Giggles exact revenge on the people who hurt you? It did. She leaned forward with a sympathetic smile. I think we both know who was really in control. With the therapist's help, I broke free of Mr. Giggles. The urge to wear him subsided, slowly. 
freeing me from his dark influence. In time, his voice quietened, then disappeared entirely. Decades passed. I grew up, got married, and mostly forgot about the whole horrible ordeal. But then one night, my wife and I were arguing in the kitchen. How could you sit around playing video games for two days straight when my mother's dying in the hospital? She shouted. I sighed in response. We've been fighting a lot lately. Between me losing my job and her mother's poor health, things had become tense. Our relationship was like a pressure cooker ready to explode. Don't you give a shit about anyone but yourself? She asked. Without answering, I stormed into the hall. A moment later, I felt a peculiar pinch at the back of my skull. You didn't forget about your old pal Mr. Giggles, did ya? In an almost trance-like state, I made my way towards the attic. There, I pushed aside the boxes filled with old clothes until I stumbled upon the familiar hamper. Mr. Giggles was wearing his trademark pinstripe suit and a red bow tie. I gulped. My hand trembled as it approached the slot in his back. A tingling sensation danced across my fingertips. Jolts of excitement ran from my palm down to the soles of my feet. With a heavy sigh, I closed my eyes and slid him onto my arm. The moment I did, his mouth flapped open. Killed the bitch. I ripped him off. He looked up at me. That self-satisfied grin forever painted on his face. I couldn't keep him around. If I did, some twisted part of my subconscious might have acted out. I loved my wife more than anything. Oh, sure. We'd been having problems lately, but so did every couple. I carried Mr. Giggles downstairs meaning to rush straight to the dump and be done with him once and for all. But then my wife shouted from within the kitchen, Where the hell do you think you're going? My jaw clenched. In the back of my mind, my therapist spoke in a calm voice. Think back to those times Mr. Giggles took control. Before he did, were you feeling scared or angry or upset? Perhaps it was best to face my problems head on. Oh, sure, I could get rid of Mr. Giggles, but the underlining issue would still be there. Breathing deeply, I set him aside and entered the kitchen. My wife was standing behind the counter, gritting her teeth. I raised a hand. I've got something to say. She opened her mouth to protest. Two minutes. That's all I'm asking for. She sighed. I know I haven't been very attentive lately, but it's just between losing my job and... She rolled her eyes. But that's no excuse. I understand that now. First thing tomorrow, I'll start looking for a new one. And I'm putting a stop to the gaming. I swear. She sighed. Promise? Promise. We kissed. Honey, I said. I've got some stuff to take to the dump. Want me to pick up anything from the store on the way back? No, I think we're fine. As I wandered back to the hall, my wife grabbed an envelope off the counter. Before I could leave the house, she screamed louder than a 747 taking flight. What the fuck do you think you're doing spending $5,000 on OnlyFans? She had opened our credit card bill. I clutched Mr. Giggles between two quaking hands. Kill her. She'll never understand you like I do. Kill her. Then it'll just be like old times. At that moment, I realized my therapist was wrong. Mr. Giggles was real, and no amount of new age hippie bullshit could convince me otherwise. He couldn't be stopped. Not by me. Not by anybody. Get back here, you sleazy piece of shit. I closed my eyes, took a deep breath, and pulled him onto my arm. Once he was in position, 
His head did a complete full rotation. He guided us back to the kitchen, where my wife was red with fury. What the fuck is that on your arm? Ignoring her, Mr. Giggles grabbed a knife off the counter, then raised it above his head. I'd almost given up on love. After five years of pointless scrolling, it was time to face the facts. Girls just weren't interested in nice guys like me. But then a notification popped up one morning. It's a match. Irene had soft eyes and curling brown hair that fell about her shoulders. Her smile was shy, with a hint of mischief. I thought long and hard about my opening line. I had to both strike the proper tone and make her feel special. Hi, you seem interesting. Like someone I'd like to know better. Not like all the other girls on here. She replied a few minutes later. That's so sweet of you to say. You seem pretty interesting yourself. Smiley face. Do you live alone? After a flirtatious back and forth, I asked her out to dinner. I'd love to, but I'm working late. I'll be so hungry when my shift ends. If only I knew a handsome gentleman who could cook. Winky face. I waited for almost a full minute before replying, so as not to appear desperate. Why don't you come over to my place tonight? I'm a great cook. Irene replied, sounds good, X. Boom. Just like that, I had a date. I bought a mop and vacuum to clean the apartment with and lit a few candles to set the mood. Irene messaged at about 10 p.m. I'm outside. She was early. There is no time for a shower. And I couldn't find a single can of deodorant. Luckily, I bathed three days earlier. Crisis averted. I put on the Avatar The Last Airbender original soundtrack, then dimmed the lights. I made my way to the front door, stopped at the mirror to straighten my tie, then turned the handle. Whenever I saw Irene, my heart skipped a beat. Her grey-green eyes glimmered like emeralds, and her intoxicating aroma reminded me of a freshly opened pack of Pokemon cards. She was wrapped in multiple layers of clothing, barely showing any skin at all. A rare virtue in a western woman. Aren't you going to invite me in? She said eventually. Her voice was confident, yet somehow submissive. I swept a hand across the apartment and tipped my fedora. My lady. Irene kept her coat on as I guided her towards the dining room. She took a seat at my secret Lab Omega 2020 series gaming chair while I sat facing her on a wooden one the previous owners left behind when they moved out. I asked Irene about her work, her family, and her sexual history. She gave short, curt answers to all of my questions. Periodically, her stomach grumbled. It was rather unladylike, although I held my tongue. She surveyed the room. Are we alone? Yup. I smiled. It's just the two of us. Her eyes focused on mine. Perfect. The way she said it sent my heart rate soaring. At one point, I excused myself to begin preparing the meal. Then we resumed chatting. As we talked, Irene propped her head up using her arm and leaned forward, seductively. What's that thing? With a gloved hand, she gestured past my left shoulder, towards a katana mounted across the wall. Oh, that's... It's a Japanese sword, crafted by a master smith in Yokohama. I turned back towards her. If you're lucky, perhaps I'll give you a little demonstration later. A few minutes later, right as I was in the middle of explaining Jordan Peterson's 12 rules for life, the microwave dinged. Excuse me. I served Irene's portion first, bowing as I laid it before her. 
Bon Appetit. The Hot Pockets turned out sweet and delectable. A thick celebration of cheese, meat, and vegetables. But while I scoffed mine down, Irene only eyed her plate with disdain. I swallowed a mouthful. Is everything okay? She bit her bottom lip and nodded as her stomach grumbled, even louder than before. I shrugged and continued eating. By the time I was finished, she'd hardly taken a single bite. What's the matter? I asked, a tone of concern in my voice. She rubbed her belly. I'm not really in the mood for... Her voice trailed off as she prodded the hot pocket with her fork. I'm in the mood for... something else. She stood, circled the computer desk, and gently pressed a finger against my lips. Before I knew it, we were kissing. Irene swung over onto my lap. Our tongues acted in perfect synchronization, like Goku and Vegeta performing the fusion dance. Anticipation swelled beneath my cargo shorts. I'd been looking forward to this moment for 36 years. Irene bit my bottom lip, hard. I grimaced with pain and pulled back. Then a trickle of blood ran down my chin. She gave me a nasty smile, showing a mouthful of curved teeth, and licked her lips with a forked tongue. Mmm, you taste good. Irene stood and began undressing. For a moment, it appeared as though things were looking up. Although her monstrous teeth were repulsive, I still considered Irene attractive. But then, before my horrified eyes, her clothes fell to the ground. From the neck down, Irene's body was covered with translucent skin, grotesquely colored. Stretch taut over well-defined bones, bat-like wings spanning no less than thrice the width of her body expanded. Then she pulled off her gloves, revealing long, sharp claws. A set of small, yet perfectly shaped breasts sat proudly atop her chest. My knees trembled as Irene leaned in close. Before I could react, her cold claw wrapped around my neck and lifted me from my chair, pinning me against the wall. I made a faint rasp and tried to pry her fingers off my neck. Irene's tongue probed my face as she moaned with what I assumed to be feminine delight. The edge of my vision blurred, and my temples started throbbing. Desperately, I felt along the wall, probing for something, anything, that could help. My left hand touched something metal, the katana. In one smooth motion, I grabbed it off the wall and angled it downward. The sheath fell to the floor. Irene's jaw closed around my neck, puncturing the flesh. I screamed, then twisted the blade around and thrust it into her back, right between the shoulder blades. She made a sudden cry of pain and relinquished her grip. Irene whirled around, shrieking. The blade tore a strip of flesh as I ripped it out. Before I could strike a second time, Irene flapped her wings. The left one collided with my chest, knocking me clean across the table. The jolt of the impact made me groan. Red lines trickled down my neck, stemming from the point where Irene bit me. I scrambled back to my feet, katana in hand. Irene bared her fangs. The computer desk stood between us. Why you? She said with fury. Green blood blossomed from her back. I took several short, quick breaths. What the fuck is going on here? I stammered. Isn't it obvious? A horrible grin broke out on Irene's face. The end of the blade wobbled in my unsteady hand. She circled to my right. I turned to follow, keeping the desk between us. I'm here to eat you. I stalked dating sites for horny losers like you, and then I gobbled them up. Irene burst forward, 
A desperate flail of my blade sent her whining back. I gulped. Gobble up. Just what the hell are you? Explain yourself. Irene leaned forward. It doesn't matter what I am. All that matters is what you are. Oh, I said, then gulped. And what's that? She grinned. A fat 30-year-old virgin who's about to be dinner. Like hell I'm about to be dinner, I shouted. I tried to slash, but Irene jerked back, just out of reach, and the silver blade cut only air. She took another swipe at me. I backed up a step. She swiped again and again, finding only the space above the desk. I held my breath and steadied my arms. All I had to do was watch my opponent for an opening. Each time Irene got ready to strike, her muscles tensed. That was it. The next time her muscles contracted, a delicate stroke sent her fingers flying through the air. She growled like a wounded orc and staggered back. While Irene clutched her hand and squealed, I slipped around the desk ready to deliver a finishing blow. Her eyes focused on me with murderous intent. With her uninjured hand, Irene lashed out, forcing me backward. I answered her attacks with strikes of my own, once, twice, attesting. There was a loud whoosh as Irene spread her wings and flew forward. No, I screamed, swinging wildly. The blade cut across her stomach. Anguished wails followed. Irene hit me with a meaty thump. Then we both spilled onto the floor. The katana landed between us. We both grabbed for it at the exact same moment, me getting there first. I rose. Irene looked up at me, my blade poised, calm, and ready. Green liquid pumped out of the deep wound in her stomach. She clutched it with both hands, jaws clenched. She was defeated. We both knew it. Her strength was no match for my prowess. Those countless hours cutting open bottles of Mountain Dew in my mom's backyard had not been in vain. Irene stumbled to her feet. Glistening green blood and ribbons of taut flesh dangled from where my strikes had connected. I held the katana firm with both hands. Irene's wings collapsed into her back. Then she began pulling on her clothes. Still only half-dressed, she made her way towards the door. She looked back towards me with a look of utter disdain. I chuckled in response. The door crashed shut behind her. In the bathroom, I unrolled toilet paper and dabbed my wound. I stared at my reflection with pure disbelief. What were the odds my first ever date would turn out to be a hideous monster? It had undoubtedly been the second worst date of my entire life. On the counter, my phone chimed. It's a match. Excitement swelled in my stomach. The girl I matched with, Alice, was even more beautiful than Irene. Her skin was like mocha cappuccino. Very exotic. Very sexy. Sitting down to feast on the still warm hot pockets Irene had for gone, I sent Alice a message. Hi, you seem interesting. Like someone I'd like to know better. Not like all the other girls on here. If I'd known further terrors lay ahead, I would have uninstalled the app right then and there. But, like a fool, I didn't. After all, what were the odds of something like that happening again? Have you ever heard the story of Jam Jam the Ice Cream Man? No? Well that's okay. Not many people outside of my town know who Jam Jam is. In life, his name was James Dern, and he was a pretty simple guy. All he wanted in life was to make children happy. Supposedly, from the stories I've heard growing up, James Dern was not the most handsome, nor the brightest. But he was incredibly loving and giving. His parents were extremely controlling and extremely religious, 
to an obsessive degree. It seems everything that James did was wrong in the eyes of his parents. He laughed too loudly. He smiled too broadly. They didn't like him telling jokes or dancing because children of God should be serious about life. This constant disapproval and subsequent punishment for his wrongdoings eventually started to eat away at James' cheerful disposition. He kept trying to fight it though, and he kept trying to do what he thought was his reason for being, making people happy. In high school, James started dressing up as a clown and going to local children's hospitals after school. He would make balloon animals and tell the patients jokes to cheer them up. His parents and their circle of friends thought what James was doing was making a mockery of the sick and told him that if he really wanted to help them, he would offer up prayers at the hospital instead of being a clown. When James became an adult, he scrapped together all of his savings and bought a truck. Combining his love for ice cream and his passion with making people, especially children, happy. I always thought the reason he focused on making children happy was because his own childhood was marred with such sadness and cruelty. But I digress. Anyways, because James had such an innocence about him and childlike personality, rumors started after he opened his ice cream truck for business that a grown man could not possibly be that way unless it was a ruse for some nefarious purposes. But even with the rumors about James circulating, his ice cream truck was a hit. He started dressing up in his old clown outfits and went by the name Jam Jam the Ice Cream Man. All the children and most parents loved him, and whenever they'd hear his truck jingle, they'd come running in droves. One day, Jam Jam was running late on his route, but was insistent that he do it anyway, knowing that it made people happy to see him in his ice cream truck rolling around. The sun had just set and the air was cool, as Jam Jam happily drove around in his truck. He slammed on his brakes as he turned the corner onto a Bernathy Bridge, the horrific scene in front of him rooting him to the spot. A group of teenage boys stood around a naked, unconscious girl, some zipping up their pants, some peeing on the poor girl. Jam Jam honked his horn to scare the boys off, and when they looked up and saw him, they sneered and ran off shouting obscenities at him as they left. Jam Jam got out of his truck and ran to the girl, using his clown top to cover her body. Uncaring of the coldness, settling in on his lanky tank top covered frame, he gently nudged her and brushed her long hair out of her face. He noticed blood on the girl's lips and cried in fear as he inspected her mouth, revealing her tongue had been cut out. He screamed and cried for help trying to get anyone's attention that may have been near. It was then that the town's biggest gossip came jogging by, dragging her Yorkshire Terrier by its leash. She had been scolding the little dog on not going to the bathroom yet when she saw Jam Jam hovering over the girl clad only in his tank top and clown pants. The woman screamed and ran off as Jam Jam tried desperately to get her to call someone for help. He had no phone and he didn't want to leave the poor girl by herself. She was still alive, but just barely. After a moment, angry shouts came from down the road, and Jam Jam stood up to flag them down, not knowing that the men were coming for him. The lady had told anyone and everyone she could find that Jam Jam had hurt and possibly killed a young girl down by a Bernathy bridge. She came to the house where some of the boys who attacked the girl lived, and as she told their father what she saw, the boys quickly agreed and lied that they had also seen Jam Jam but ran off because they were scared of him. His momentary relief was quickly shot down as some of the men grabbed him and violently dragged him into the nearby woods. The other men stayed behind to get the girl to the hospital. Jam Jam cried and yelled for them to listen to what happened and what he saw but the men were crazed with a violent mob mentality. Freak, they shouted, as they pried open his mouth to cut out his tongue. Knew there was something not right about you, others screamed as they spat on him. A grown man acting the way you do? Of course you'd be a pedo, Moore yelled. 
The mob was practically rabid in their hate for this guy, they always deemed as odd. After cutting off his tongue, the men strung up poor Jam Jam in the woods as he whimpered and cried. Jam Jam's fear and pain and confusion morphed into rage and hate as he hung there wondering why this was to be his end when his entire life was about making others happy. He vowed to himself that he would have his revenge. After Jam Jam took his last breath, the men cheered and set his body on fire. But they were not done with their hate. The one possession that Jam Jam owned and took such pride in was his ice cream truck. The men laughed as they banded together as one to push Jam Jam's beloved truck into the river that ran under a Bernathy bridge. The young girl miraculously survived, and when she learned what happened to Jam Jam, she cried silently for days after she wrote down to authorities what really happened on that fateful night. The police arrested the boys that had actually raped the young girl, but the small mob of men that murdered Jam Jam were never tried. The reason being that they were acting in self-defense for the girl on the assumption that Jam Jam was assaulting her. It honestly didn't matter what they did. The damage had been done. An innocent man was tortured and killed by a group of people that already had prejudice against him for being what they deemed to be different. And ever since then, our town has been in the grips of Jam Jam's revenge. Or so it goes, I guess. I do believe the story about the girl and Jam Jam's innocence, however, because my source for that is someone I highly trust. My great aunt was the poor girl on the bridge, but as far as Jam Jam's revenge, I don't know how much I believe since I've never seen anything. According to rumors, people walking around past dusk will start to hear the jingle of his ice cream truck. If you hear the jingle, you're pretty much marked for death. They said Jam Jam lets you hear the jingle of his ice cream truck to know that he is coming for you and later, while you're in your nice warm bed thinking you're safe, you'll hear it again, the jingle. Jam Jam will come to your room and you'll smell the scent of scorched flesh before you actually see him. Slowly, very slowly, you'll start to see the blackened claws of his fingers as he snakes his way on your bed. You won't be able to run as his badly burned and decayed face looms over you. And then, just when you open your mouth to scream, he rips your tongue from you. Honestly, now that I think about it, I don't believe it. Rather, I don't want to believe it. Considering that I was on my way to my girlfriend's house to drop off some textbooks she left at my place. I thought I could get there in time and be back before the sun set but my neighbor Edward stopped me to chat and I lost track of time. The sun had just set, but it's fine. I'm almost at my house anyway. Hey Brian, you hear that? My next door neighbor called to me from his driveway. His family had just moved here about a month ago from Texas, so he hadn't heard the story of Jam Jam the Ice Cream Man. I shook my head no in response to his question, although I did hear it. Clear as day, I hurried in as my neighbor called out to me. What the hell do you suppose an ice cream man is doing out at this time of night? As a broke student, you know we're always looking for a way to make quick money without having to do anything you're not okay with. I've filled out online surveys tested products for small amounts of money, and done jobs for friends and family to gather a little extra cash. I filled job applications out like you wouldn't believe, but you probably would believe that it ain't easy to get a job with little to no experience when you're fresh out of high school and straight into college. My parents gave me money during high school, and truth be told, I'd rather have been hanging out with my friends outside of school than looking for a part-time job. So I ended up in college and experience less. I am rooming with my friend from high school, Kate. Kate was pretty much in the same boat as me when it came not to having experience and finding it hard to get a job. We were Google searching how to make money fast, 
since despite both of us being from pretty well off families, we didn't want to have to depend on our parents for money whenever we wanted it. We came across a blog that had some pretty bogus ideas, but some okay ones too. The one that caught our eyes was selling things we didn't want anymore on eBay for some quick cash. We figured we had plenty of stuff we could sell for a decent amount, so we both put some items up for sale and waited around. Honestly, money came in quicker than I would have thought. It wasn't huge amounts, but given we were living together and could share appliances like hair dryers and straightening irons, we had no problem selling the spares. We made enough money within a couple of weeks to be able to take a break from it and go and spend our newly earned money. We were browsing the homepage to see if there was anything we fancied. Hey, Kate nudged me. I wonder what the weirdest shit that's been sold on here is. I let out a chuckle. Let's find out. We clicked through the ads until we came across one ad that caught both of our eyes. My breath in a jar. Buy it now. $79.99 Kate and I looked at each other and burst out laughing. I wonder if anything like this had sold before. So I typed in breath in jar, click search, and filtered the results to sold items only. When I say I was shocked, that's a gigantic understatement. There was pages of this sort of thing. People claiming it was the breath of celebrities. Their own breath. You name it. One had sold for $400 that the seller claimed was a celebrity that had died a month or two prior. We had a good laugh at it all before a stupid thought popped into my head. I bet someone is willing to pay me big bucks for my soul on here. I laughed. Kate snorted, shoving me. You're serious? Dude, you have to post this. It would be the funniest thing ever. I shot Kate a smile and got to work on the ad. Soul for sale. 19 year old girl. Once you hit buy, it's yours for all eternity. $50,000. No refunds. Kate let out a gasp. Anna. She started. 50k? Come on. What? I giggled. A soul this great don't come cheap. She rolled her eyes, spewed about some shit about why nobody was going to pay that much, and after a few days, we pretty much forgotten about the whole thing. Two nights ago, at around 1am, we just finished watching a movie and we got into bed. We were chatting in the dark and getting pretty tired when my phone vibrated from the nightstand. I picked it up, looked at the notification and screamed, dropping my phone on the floor beside my bed. Kate jumped out of bed, picking my phone up off the floor. She too let out a scream when she read the notification. PayPal, $50,000. I looked at Kate, who stood there in silence, staring at me. That has to be a joke, right? It's not real. Surely, it's not. She passed my phone back to me. I went onto my PayPal account, clicked my balance and hit withdraw. Then a notification popped up from my bank app. $50,000 received from PayPal. I screamed again. I showed it to Kate. She screamed again. Campus security knocked on our door a few minutes later, asking if we were alright. We assured him that we were fine and sat in our beds, just looking at my bank account balance. I don't know what time we fell asleep, but eventually we did. Yesterday, I woke up and Kate was already up and dressed. Come on, sleepyhead. She pulled the blankets off of me. Shower and get dressed. We've got some shopping to do. I groaned and got out of bed. There's still a pandemic, you know. I sighed. Okay, the mall is open and we have masks. Come on. I sighed again 
and eventually after some persuasion, jumped in the shower, got dressed, and we left the dorm room to head to the mall. Kate was so full of energy, she even had a spring in her step. As for me, I felt nothing. I put it down to me being tired, so when Kate asked why I seemed so grumpy, I gave her the excuse I was giving myself. I bought so much shit. I bought a new laptop for school that I desperately needed, but that didn't satisfy me. I bought so many pairs of shoes, so many outfits, so much makeup, but I still wasn't satisfied. Kate was in her element all day. I, on the other hand, wasn't. I just wanted to go back to our dorm. The time finally came to go home, and for the first time all day, I felt somewhat happy. Happy it was over. When I got back to the dorm, my parents called me and I couldn't wait to get rid of them. I hadn't seen either of them for over a month by this point, but I was glad of it. My dad was halfway through telling me he loved me and I hung up, making a gagging noise. It was from that moment that I felt like something was wrong. I've always loved my parents and talking to them, but now I couldn't stand the thought of them. Hey, I turned to Kate, who was trying on her new outfits. Do you think that person really bought my soul? Kate let out a loud laugh and checked herself out again in the mirror. Dude, come on. Do you really think people were selling famous breath? You're being stupid. I felt as though my blood was burning inside of me. I hated what she just said. I hated her. Yeah, and you're being a bitch. I snapped. Hey. Kate turned to me. Hands on her hips. What have you got your underwear in a twist for? Maybe you need some sleep or something. Jeez. Maybe you need your throat slit. Kate looked at me in what I can only describe as shock and a little fear. She took a small step backwards and stared at me without saying a word. I'm, uh, I'm sorry. I mumbled. I didn't mean it. Truth is, I did mean it. Something came over me, and in that moment, I really meant it. She stood there for another second, staring. After what felt like fucking forever, she finally spoke. What's gotten into you, Anna? Why are you acting so weird today? I shrugged my shoulders and stood up, heading towards the door and leaving Kate stood in our room, completely flabbergasted. I went to a nearby store and bought some supplies before heading to a park to sit there for a while. When I finally arrived back to the dorm, Kate was asleep in her bed. I walked slowly over to her and took the box of razor blades I bought out of my bag. I stared at it for a while before looking down at Kate when something caught my eye from beside me. The mirror that was on the wall facing Kate's bed was showing my reflection, standing over my best friend with a razor in hand. I watched, completely still, as my arm and my reflection moved and ran its fingers over the sharp end of the razor blade. Blood trickled down from its finger, and my reflection raised its arm and sucked it off. I was frozen. I could taste my blood. My reflection leaned over Kate's bed and dug the razor into her neck, quickly pulling it across her neck. Blood spilled everywhere as Kate's reflection twitched and jerked and tried to stop herself from bleeding. I looked down to my best friend beside me, who was sleeping soundly, unharmed. Kate's reflection stopped convulsing and my reflection raised the blade and pulled it across its tongue. I could taste the blood again. My reflection walked forward, and I followed, standing face to face with myself. This is the beginning. My reflection whispered, blood trickling out of my mouth as it spoke. I stared into its eyes. They were cold, black, soulless. I shut my eyes tight, and when I opened them, I was looking at myself again, 
my real self. I stared into my eyes for a few seconds, noticing that there was a dark black ring around the outside of my iris, and I think it's very slowly growing. This morning I checked it again, and it's slightly bigger. The scariest part of all of this is that when I was watching my reflection kill my best friend, part of me enjoyed it. I thought it was a joke. I thought for sure I'd get an email from whoever this was demanding their money back. But 30 minutes ago, they left a 5 star review on my eBay page. I sold my soul on eBay for only 50k and I need to get it back. Shout out to my super fans, Sweet Black Swan and Tacy. I really appreciate you guys supporting my channel and I look forward to creating more content for everyone.